Welcome to Sunday, October 15th. I believe it's like the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Something like that. So we are on proper... Let me get my mouse to the right spot. Proper 23. And we have our lessons of Isaiah 25, Psalm 23, Philippians 4, and Matthew 22. Uh, this morning, I didn't preach on a particular one, probably on the gospel lesson, but more so in general on this topic that's moving through the last few weeks. And so we've talked about that a little bit more on this follow-up to really discuss the idea of who is Israel and the importance of Israel. And again, as I told my parishioners this morning, I think that there's a real element of this that is particularly valid for our modern situation. I'd like to actually, after um, I do the this mainstream that I'll load in YouTube, I'm going to follow up on Kick with some shorter things that I'll probably upload later about Israel and Hamas. But for now, we're looking at these lessons. So we're going to start with the Old Testament lesson. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts... Oh, make sure. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will... Uh, swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations he will swallow up death forever and the lord god will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the lord has spoken it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. He, we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Now, for me, and I don't know necessarily how Jews take this, but this is about the Feast of Victory. This is about the final feast, you know, where the sacrament of the altar is a foretaste of the feast to come. And this is in particularly talking about that feast. So that the feast that he has on this mountain, right, the mountain of Jerusalem or Mount Zion, that is where the Lord of hosts will have his rich food with his people. And it is this food that provides forgiveness. It is this food that provides redemption, salvation from the thing that covers all of us, which is death. The covering over all the peoples, the veil over all the nations, what is swallowed up on this name on this mountain is death and here not just a particular person's death or not just death in a vague sense but this is really death forever and that's why i think that it's important to be able to identify it with the resurrection of the dead life everlasting because that's kind of where that ultimately culminates now, the other thing is, is that this picture's back, um, and since I have my text here, this picture's back to Exodus 24, where, if you recall, the covenant is conferred on Israel, and you'll see that Moses and Aaron, Adab and Abihu, 70 elders, and let me scroll down so you can see it better they saw the god of israel 
and there was under his feet a pavement of sapphire and so forth. And then you finally get down and they beheld God and ate and drank with him. They participated in a foretaste of the feast to come. And this is what Isaiah pick, is picking up on. So in Isaiah 25, we have this feast, right? God will swallow up death forever. And so on this mountain, right? So there's a parallel there and it focuses forward to the Feast of Victory. And that's where then you get the idea that, uh, where is it? He will wipe away all their tears from all their faces. The reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, right? This is about the final forgiveness of sins, the final taking away and restoring Israel to its rightful position. This is when you kind of get to that point of finally acknowledging that God is God. So, that being said, that's kind of where you get the salvation element. Then they wait for the wait for the day of salvation. How long, O oh Lord? How long? This is the culmination of the people of God. Um, and you'll note, uh, I'll talk more about this in a different video, but the people of God is the people of Israel, but it's the people of Israel in a biblical sense, not the people of a nation state of Israel. Um, all right, then we have the famous Psalm 23. And since there's, you know, like two of you here, I guess, um, that's fine if you want me to go through it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And this is a part of why it's here, because the walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, that you still have that same aspect at the end of the Old Testament lesson. And you're you're really getting towards the rod and the staff that comfort me. But um, finally, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What is the table that is prepared before the people of Israel or the people of God today um, before in the presence of their enemies that they have this table prepared? Well, that's the foretaste of the feast to come. And whether that foretaste is embodied in the celebration of Passover for the Old Testament, for Old Testament Israel, or whether it's embodied in the sacrament of the altar for New Testament people. This is the feast that you gather together. This is the table that is prepared. And we anoint our heads with oil and our cup overflows because of the great blessings that we receive. Um, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, focused on the resurrection. All right, so we'll come back to this feast idea because the feast idea is embodied in the parable that Jesus gives in the gospel lesson as well. But it, both the Old Testament lesson talks about this feast of victory in, in Israel. Psalm 23 talks about, again, this feast of victory in the presence of Israel. Um, and again, I don't know how um jews necessarily see that as a culmination of the passover if they recognize some sort of culmination of the passover event uh i don't you know i know the importance of passover i know the importance of the day of atonement and of course rosh hashanah in making atonement um before the world and making atonement before god um that this i some of those ideas i understand but again I'm not ingrained in their theology or in their practice to be able to tell you what kind of is the general scope of how they treat these passages of feasting. Um, so let's move on to then 
Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. The, the emphasis of rejoicing in the time of suffering, in the time of sorrow. That's the key there. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So again, don't be anxious about things, but pray to God. If you're worried about something, lay it at the foot of the cross, lay it before God your Father, and trust in His will to be done. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that's kind of the goal there. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So when I, when I come across this passage, it's very much the, the concern that I have with whatever is true, what, what in our world is true? What is certain? What is honorable? Now, maybe you could think of certain honorable things. Maybe you think of like a noble cause or you think of something as praiseworthy or, or some sense like that. But are those things always true? And then whatever, so whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. So sometimes we may claim victory or we may rejoice in a victory, but it wasn't just it might have you might say it was just in the sense that the bigger person won but was it necessarily just in the sense that the person in the right won or was it just in the sense that the person who got hurt or defeated got a balance of of their defeat I don't know how to say that. Better. So there's like a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, right? All of that, that's partially designed to say that if you gouge out my eye, I don't take off your leg, right? So if that's the case, if the idea is, is that I don't take off your leg, was whatever it was just? Did I give as good as I received justly? Was it pure? Was there no false motives? Was there, was there no uncleanliness involved? Whatever is lovely or beautiful, whatever is commendable, as if something for everyone to partake in or everyone to do. If there is anything excellent, oh, sorry. If there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And this is what I go back to is, is generally we get a list like this and we're like, okay, think about lovely things. Think about pure things. Think about things that are commendable. But what is true? What is honorable? What is actually just? Pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, perfect, practically perfect in every way, not Mary Poppins, but God. And the works of God in your life. When St. Paul writes this, think about these things. There's really this sense in which St. Paul is asking you to think about the things that God has put in your life. 
Think about the way in which God has worked in your life. These are the honorable. These are the true things. These are the just things. These are the pure things. And then he follows this up so that, again, we're going to probably say this quite a few times today. I'm not trying to take this out of context. I'm trying to keep it in context. What is one of the most true or most honorable or most pure things? Well, that is the love of God or the peace of God which surpasses our comprehension. So what does St. Paul desire us to do? Well, think about this. Think about this thing. Think about this peace that you can never understand. What does that mean to have a peace that you can never understand? That you can never comprehend? Um, what you have learned and received and heard and seen me practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Again, so now he's he is making a movement from think about just the peace of God and the work of God, but also think about the way in which God works in your life and through you. And think about these things because what you have learned and received and heard is all about the practices that God continues to work through us. Practice these things. Do these things as God continues to work through you. The God of peace will be with you. All right. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at great at length, you have revived your concern for me. Um, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Uh, this is probably a response to whatever he got. Like he probably got some sort of encouragement or encouraging letter, which is causing him to write this, and so. The idea is, is that they've been thinking about him and thank God that they've been thinking about him. And this is offered an opportunity for this letter to be written, for the gospel to continue to be vibrantly shared in Philippi and so forth. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So again, St. Paul isn't talking about out of his need you know, thank you for remembering me and thank you for giving me all this wonderful stuff. Thank you for appreciating me and all the hard work that I put in. Um, please, please, as you as you see me put in this hard work, please go in and um, give the effort yourself. No, this is about just remembering it. Just recognizing that he is fighting a good, he is fighting the good fight. He is fighting a battle for his life in in the courts of Caesar. Not that I am speaking of being in need, right? For I have learned in whatever situation to be content. So then we're at verse twelve, kind of the end of this. I know how to be brought low and I know how to be to abound in any of uh, every circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance and need I can do all things through him who strengthens me all right this is the final part that probably has to be addressed in this passage so while it does go back to every whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is just, so forth, which are the things of God. Then, then we trust in God. We trust in God to provide for his people. We trust in God to give us the gifts we need. We trust in God 
to be able to take care of us. We trust in God to do everything for us. So we're content with what God has given us. And yeah, God may have given you a lot or maybe given me more than you or, or you less than me or however it may be. Or maybe I have less than you or I, I don't know the situation um, that God has placed us all in. But the idea is, is that we should be content. We should be satisfied with what we have. And love our family, love those people that are around us. And maybe we don't have enough food on our table. And maybe we don't have all the glorious things that we, we desire. But we need to be content. And yet, at the same time, I'm going to say, which this text isn't necessarily speaking to, because really Paul is speaking about himself. Paul is speaking about himself. I am speaking of being in need. I am not speaking of being in need. Because Paul doesn't see himself as in need. Paul has all kinds of support around him as he is as he is dealing with Roman centurions, as he's dealing with the Imperial Guard, as he has, you know, this group of people around him to support him. He's not in need. So don't worry about sending a bunch of gifts and a bunch of stuff. Because realistically, Paul Paul's head could be cut off the next day. I don't know when he wrote this in particular, but he could have been like posted in the mail and boop, next day, head cut off. You know, that could have been the situation, but we don't know. But you wouldn't want those people there concerned about sending him money if that was the situation. And that's not what he wants. What he wants is for them to realize that he has learned to be content with his situation. He's been brought low. He's been made to abound. He's been in any and every circumstance with plenty, with little, with abundance, with need. He's been there. And through all of it, it is not the wealth that makes him strong. It is not the amount of money he has that makes him strong. It's not the number of friends he has that makes him strong. It's not the power that he wields or the armies or any sort of strength. He is strong because he's strong in the Lord. I can do all things through him who strengthens me isn't about the fact that I can win victory because God is behind my fists. You know, it, that's not it. Or I can run the race really fast because God is behind me, you know, helping me. Or I'm going to win the basketball game because God is with me. No, that's not the point. The point is, is that whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, God is with me and he is where my salvation lies. Right? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. All right. So hopefully we're not confused about that. Um, wow, watch those questions just not roll in. Okay. Yeah, watch the people just leave me as I talk about that. Again, my my point is not so much to to talk about the way in which this passage can be used to inspire people, but again in context what we're looking at and so similarly i'm going to jump to matthew uh, 22 um, in this tech in the actual bible text um, because i want to go back and remind you that the last couple weeks um well we didn't have we had this parable of the laborers in the vineyard where they all got paid different wages and then um, he says, so last will be first and the first will be last. And then we got this parable of the two sons. The parable of the two sons where, again, what do you think? A man has two sons. First son says, I will go and work in the vineyard and doesn't. First son said, 
he said, son, go and work in the vineyard. And he said, I will not. And yet he changes his mind and he goes. The second son, he says the same thing to. And I go, sir, but he didn't go. So which of the two sons? Well, tax collectors and so they say the first, because even though the first said, I will not, afterwards he changed his mind and he went. And so Jesus says, truly, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Right? Because, and the idea there is, is because they're the ones that are actually going to trust in the Lord for their salvation. You're going to trust in your works. You're going to trust in your own means. You're going to trust in your definition and your utilization of the Torah. Um, and, and this is even part of the importance of, and I don't know why I really want to talk about this right now, but the difference between Judaism and Old Testament Israel is huge. Because most of Judaism and most of the theology of Judaism really doesn't come up until until after the destruction of the temple when they kind of have to rework how they think about things and how they're going to worship God because you can't take your I mean in this day and age you cannot take your sacrifices for the day of atonement or your sacrifice of the Passover to the mountain you can't take it to the dome of the rock and say, well, I'm sacrificing it here because this is where the temple stood. You know, you have to, for, for those Jews that actually still do sacrifices, they have to make a makeshift altar to do it. It's not the one altar that was in Jerusalem at this time when Jesus is speaking these words. So it's different. It's all different. Um... Parable of tenants, the big thing here that I think is important, and I think I talked about this last week, is that they perceived that this was about them. They recognized right off the bat that Jesus is telling this parable about them. They are the wicked tenants. They are the ones that are in control of the vineyard, and somebody's going to come in and wipe them out. And... I generally take this in connection with 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. I don't necessarily see this as any implication on today's day and age, in which case we need to go and wipe out the nation of Israel. No, no, that's absolutely horrific. Um, we're not going to attack Israel. I think that that's a bad idea. Um, and similarly, I think that, you know, Hamas is what their name says, which is wicked and violent um, and evil. But at the, at the same time, you know, you really got to go to um, recognizing who is Israel. And these apparently set up the fact that apparently Israel is going to get their stuff taken away from them and handed over to a new Israel. Which isn't to say that the new Israel won't include old Israelites, right? When you, when you think of the church, and maybe this is a misconception that a lot of people have, because they think of the church as a bunch of Gentiles. Instead of re remembering that the church, the church began very Jewish, right? Because, and so there's a history to the church in Judaism, but more so in Israel. Um, yeah, and this is this is kind of interesting. All right, I'm feeling like I could fall asleep, which is bad. That's not the way to do this stuff. All right, so those are the tenants. All right, so this is the text for today, and this. This has a lot of stuff going on here, and we kind of mentioned some of it previously. But the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. 
right off the bat, this is this is different. Right? You have the two sons in the first part. Let me see what this says. Oh, that's just the three for verse three. Wow. Man, I thought that was a blue three, like this little one here. And there's something there. Man, it's just the verse. All right. So first of all, am I on the top setting? Oh, I got one more. Let's go over. Da, 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 da. I'm going the wrong way again. All right. So actually, let's go back. We're going to go back because here it's the master of a house and we introduce finally he sent his son right so there's the sending of the son there's the sending of jesus christ to the people in which case they take him out of the city and kill him for his inheritance um but here the two sons are set up the man has two sons the two sons are set up as the people right the two groups of people versus this one it's really a little bit on the king, right? The king of Israel. And so the king of Israel, the king, is going to set up a wedding feast for his son. So maybe you think of King David setting up a wedding feast for his son, Jesus. Oh, wait, is that right? Absalom, maybe Solomon. Um, I don't know. But the king is setting up a wedding feast for his son. And so he sends his servants to call all those who are invited to the wedding feast. Well, if they're invited, they should already know that they're invited, right? But apparently they need servants sent to them because, again, here it's more so because they haven't come. They haven't decided to come. They're not, they're not joining the wedding feast. So tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So come to the wedding feast. Enjoy the wedding feast. This is, this is that call. And so this goes back to what we already talked about. This goes back to Exodus chapter 24. Again, with the people of God or declaring in Exodus chapter 20, or is that 20, 24, 23, the, the people of God declare that we will do everything that he commands us to do. And so then God, in chapter 24, God takes their elders, goes, and has a feast with them. This is exactly it. Isaiah then picks up on this imagery of the feast that will, will swallow up death forever, right? This is that feast. Tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared everything. They got nothing to do. All they got to do is come, come to that feast. And they've got several invitations, but what do they do? Hmm, let's see. See, I have prepared my wedding feast, that and all the rest. Um, but they paid no attention, went off to one to his farm and another to his business. And yet some of them seized the servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. Where have we seen that before? Don't got to go too far, right? He sent other servants more, more than the first they did the same thing right took his servants and beat one killed another and stoned the third right this is this is the same thing happening and here the wicked tenants are the ones who have rejected the invitation and what happens to it the king gets ang gets angry he sends his troops to destroy those murderers and burn their city. And so you could go back to this being, again, you could go back to this to be the, 
destruction of the temple in the Old Testament, the 70 years in the exile, or again, you could connect it to Jesus. Or maybe you can connect it both. Because again, in the, God, in the parable of the wedding feast, no, in the parable of the wicked tenants, you'll remember that they came to the vineyard. Then they beat, killed, and so forth. And then he sent more messengers and they beat killed and so forth and then finally he sends um his son because he knows they won't hurt or harm the son right god knows everything and they do hurt and harm and kill the son so here you can do the destruction of the troops destroyed those murderers and burned their city. You could do it in both cases. Um, or you could do it in either or. I'm not going to pin something like that down and say, well, you ought to do it this way. Because I'm just trying to follow the text. So the king was angry and he sent his troops to destroy those murders and burn their city. Well, what city are we talking about? We're talking about the city of Jerusalem. So when did that happen? And it happened when, when David conquered Jerusalem. It happened when the temple and so forth was destroyed. Um, and it happened when... Um, mental break. It happened in 70 AD. Right. All right. So then we got no guests because all the ones we invited um, are dead. So then go to the main roads. Go everywhere and anywhere and just pack the house. So gather in anyone you want and let's fill this place. Let's do what we got to do to get these people involved. And so that's what they do. They go and the wedding hall is filled with guests they go to the bad they go to the good they go and they call gather enlighten and sanctify everyone they possibly can and so in the day of pentecost they welcome in three thousand the day of whatever they welcome in another five thousand and the apostles continue to grow in their missionary journeys the apostles continue to grow in their faith toward god that's the idea Um, and so they go, they go and find everybody. Now there is a little trick here because once apparently they go and find everybody, but when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment and he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he, and he was speechless. When the, when the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him out of the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called but few are chosen. All right, here's, here's my take on this. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting takes, and I think there's a lot of different things you can do with this. Um, but as I was thinking about this again this morning, I was thinking about this very much in the sense of you called all these people in, good, the bad, in. There's obviously still going to be some stiff-necked people out there that don't probably... And so some people will talk about, well, the wedding garment is like a fancy garment that somebody has to make themselves. And so this is about, you know, good works and making ourselves into good wedding garment people. Well, other people talk about the fact that there are 
oh, there are the wedding garments are always provided for people so that, you know, when you get there, you just, here's a wedding garment. And, um, and so apparently he just said, uh, no, I'm not wearing that. Why would I want to wear a suit coat to go into a restaurant? You know, that's, that's silly. Why would you have some sort of dress code? Um, and so I'm not doing it. And then he gets kicked out. I just, but either way, it shows a lack of contentment. It shows a lack of trust in God. It shows a lack of faith. So, yeah. And that... What gets you kicked out in the end is your lack of faith. All right. Um, so this is basically what's going on here but hopefully you can see a little bit as you move through these texts um, in Matthew and this is kind of what I preached on this morning is as you move through these texts you really recognize that Jesus in his last week of ministry because that's when this is taking place it's taking place after the triumphal entry and before the crucifixion and so this is taking place in a moment in time where Jesus is in Jerusalem teaching and preaching. And so how does this work for them? How does this work for someone in that position? Um, but more importantly, man, I, I kind of lost track of what I was saying there. So for that time period, they are perceiving that he is speaking parables against them. Then the next thing is they're going to try and trick him. They're going to try some, some different things. And then ultimately he's going to come across in chapter 23 with the woes against the Pharisees and Sadducees, which is the conclusion of his ministry. So here, they very much, the Pharisees, tax collectors, chief priests, Sadducees, all are reading through or looking through these parables, thinking about what they heard, remembering what they heard, and are going to say, no. They're going to reject. That's what they're going to do. Um, and that's what ultimately happens with Israel. Or not Israel, the Jews. I hate saying it that way. That's just a bad way to say it. So I'm going to end the this YouTube video. I'm going to stay on kick here um, but because I'm going to do kind of follow up with this with kick, but I want to separate them.